would like to welcome you to this thought for the day, uh, the war on alcohol, new puritanism or healthy sobriety. I'd like to thank Saab Miller and also the Institute of Ideas Current Affairs Forum for sponsoring this session. The issue of alcohol has hardly been out of the news over the past few years and only last Sunday it was reported in the Sunday Times that 36 under 18s are admitted to hospital daily for alcohol related injuries and, and illnesses. Um, the NHS now say that it costs them £9 million a year to deal with ambulance call-outs and the treatment of, uh, of people that have been admitted to hospital with alcohol-related problems. So, do we have a damaging and expensive drink problem in need of a solution and some or at least some control? Is the backlash against alcohol a sensible response to the dangers of alcohol or a disproportionate response to a national pastime? Indeed, is there anything about our drinking culture worth preserving? To help us unpick some of these issues today, we have a panel of four speakers. I'm going to introduce them from left to right, which is also the order in which they'll be speaking. Um, on my far left, we have Professor Mike Kelly, who is the Director of Public Health at NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Um, on my immediate left, we have Professor Virginia Berridge, who is Director at the Centre for History and Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. To my immediate right, we have Kristen Wolfe, who's the Head of Alcohol Policy at Saab Miller. And to my far right, we have Dr. Michael Fitzpatrick, who is a GP and author of The Tyranny of Health, Doctors and the Regulation of Lifestyle. Uh, can we give them all a welcome? Okay, so each of our speakers are going to give us five minutes of their thoughts, starting with Mike, please. Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. In the blurb that, uh, for the meeting, there's a quotation from um, Dr. Johnson. Uh, a tavern chair is the throne of human felicity. And of course, Dr. Johnson, as ever, <laughs> was absolutely right. If you've ever sat by Lake Como and um, enjoyed a glass of Valpolicella, um, or an English pub on a warm summer's evening uh, enjoying a glass of bitter, um, or as I used to do, work in Scotland at Dram with friends at New Year. Um, clearly, the, the joys and the pleasures of alcohol are, are obvious, and probably most of us in the room, if not all of us in the room, will have experienced it. But the Greeks, more than several millennia ago, um, when they talked about their gods, the two sons of Zeus, uh, one was um, uh, Dionysus, who brought us the vine, but the Greeks also saw him as the god of disorder and chaos. His brother Apollo was the god of order. And that dichotomy between the benefits and the disbenefits, um, the joys and the pleasures on the one hand, and the difficulties that alcohol can sometimes create, are central to understanding, I would argue, uh, the policy debates as they go on. It is important, though, that we put in perspective um, some of the critical public health problems which, to which alcohol gives rise. But actually, it's not one problem, it's three. And I think some of the confusion in this debate comes from confusing those three different problems. Problem number one is the heavy or harmful drinker, the person who is undoubtedly damaging their own health, the health of those around them, um, with, with moving towards end-state uh, organ damage, the harmful drinker um, whose addiction uh, to alcohol uh, forms a very real and present threat to their own health. The second and rather different problem arises from the drinking behaviours of young people, what sometimes referred to as teenage or binge drinking, that sort of thing. It isn't really a teenage problem necessarily, although many people under the age of 18 consume too much alcohol that's good for them, growing child and so on. I was on a train on um, Wednesday evening coming down from Sheffield, and uh, two young uh, university graduates got on. One worked in a bank, one worked in an insurance company, age about 25, I suppose, and their entire conversation was about getting off their face and hammered um, in a very, they were very well spoken about it, um, and they clearly enjoyed it, and they were looking forward to Saturday evening tonight, uh, which was the next opportunity uh, for that to happen. Excessive drinking by young people um, has sort of emerged. It's a big ticket issue as far as the media are concerned. Um, in health terms, uh, the damage is probably relatively minimal, except if there are accidents and punch-ups and fights and that sort of thing. That's the more likely uh, health consequences of that sort of behaviour. It's more of a public order issue, if you like, rather than a, than a health issue, unless 
the habits which are imbued in youth continue um, through the lifetime. The third problem, and it's the one I think people find most difficult to get, the, to get, their, to get their heads around, if you like, is the overall population level of consumption. Alcohol is now relatively less expensive than it's been uh, for many, many, many years. Um, its affordability is directly linked to patterns of population consumption. And of course, alcohol is a substance uh, which has a dose-response relationship in the human body. In other words, the more of it you consume over a chronically long period of time, even in relatively small amounts, can do uh, limited and growing amounts of damage. And I think what worries public health practitioners, rather more than the ha most harmful end of the spectrum, or indeed um, young people drinking uh, at nights in their villages, villages and towns, is the, um, is the overall population level of increase, which is building up a burden of disease across the population. The kinds of figures that um, I would share with you come from the NICE guidance when we reviewed the evidence uh, last year. About 15,000 deaths each year directly attributable to alcohol. 5,000 recorded crimes where alcohol is um, absolutely clearly uh, a causal factor. Probably more than a million incidences um, of violence, including domestic violence. About a third of all A&E attendances and about a third of all use of ambulance services. Um, costs, well, the Costs are difficult to pin down, but they're certainly, at the large end of things, um, 12.6 billion probably to the country as a whole, 2.7 directly to the National Health Service, 17 million working days lost, um, and probably 1.7 million costs to employers with time off and that sort of thing. So it's clearly a big issue. Now, I don't think it helps to frame the debate necessarily as uh, it's therefore on the basis of those figures, on the basis of the three problems I've identified, to therefore argue um, that there should be a war on alcohol. There should be a war on alcohol misuse, but that's a different thing. As I said at the beginning, the pleasures of alcohol are undeniable. Um, in moderation, um, it lubricates social affairs. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to do, and I'm sure I will enjoy a glass of wine uh, later this evening. But the build-up of the problem, at the other end of the spectrum, um, is something which constitutes a genuine, I think, public health problem, deserving of a genuine public response. Of course, one could look at the evidence, and that's what a body like the one that I work for, NICE, does, review the evidence. We concluded that there are four areas uh, where policy uh, would work, pretty, three areas where policy would work well, related to price, in particular the minimum price per unit of alcohol, uh, availability and marketing, especially marketing to children. Um, as well as services designed to uh, screen out um, problem drinkers early on, that missed opportunity so often in the drinking career uh, of someone bound for the harmful end of the spectrum. But we review the evidence and draw our conclusions. However, of course, society's response, the political response in a democratic society, has to be on the basis of what is politically feasible, what the public feel comfortable with, and what, um, in the end, people will find acceptable. So it's a very interesting balance. So to go back to Greeks, uh, the Greeks with their imaginary Apollo and Dionysus, these two sides of the human psyche, the order and the disorder, the pleasure and the discipline, these two things uh, espoused in those two sons of Zeus, I think that gives us a clue uh, to the never-ending and difficult problem uh, that this um, substance gives us. Two final thoughts or two final quotations um, one uh, was from George Bernard Shaw, who in Major, Major Barbara um, quotes or talks about alcohol as being a necessary evil. Millions of people get through their everyday lives and couldn't do so without it. But he then goes on to observe, parliamentarians do things at 11 o'clock at night, which without alcohol they've been incapable of doing at 11 o'clock in the morning. Quite what the nuance of that is, I'm, I'm not sure. The other one, which is a bit of folk wisdom, I, I did my public health training in Scotland, uh, and I spent uh, 10 years in the city of Dundee, um, which is on occasion a, a riotous place indeed, a bit like the Wild West, I used to think, although it's on the east side of the country. But the, the, the saying, I remember not long after I arrived there, um, a, a local in a pub saying to me, now son, and he said it in a very broad Dundee accent, which I won't attempt to uh, imitate, but he said, now son, I was a lot younger then too, um, now son, he said, one drink is too many. Two drinks is just right. Three drinks aren't enough. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, thanks, Mike. Um, when I read the terms of the debate, which was new Puritanism versus healthy sobriety, um, I didn't see those as necessarily being opposites. Um, but speaking as a historian, um, I did wish that we used history better um, in the debate around alcohol. And I'm not going to take a stance um, in one way or another, certainly not pro-Puritanism, but I do think that we need to look at the historical evidence um, better than we do. And I think there are lots of historical myths flying around which have fed into the current debates, and um, I want to look at some of them. The first one is that we've always been a hard-drinking society, and certainly I think that isn't the case. Uh, consumption has varied over time. There was a long decline um, in consumption from uh, the 17th century with a blip in the first half of the 18th century with the gin craze, and then levels went up in the 19th century, um, but then there was, um, they fell very rapidly from the 1870s, and that decline continued um, really for almost a century. There were low levels of drinking in the period between the two world wars, and um, that lasted right up until the 1960s. So it's only really in the last 30 or 40 years um, that we've seen consumption rise again. And also um, another change, I think, in that period has been the, the popularity of stronger drinks. So I think the point to remember is that consumption has risen and fallen in the past, and people have or haven't been concerned about it. Sometimes, in fact, in the past, and quite often in the past, particularly in the 18th century, it was considered a good thing to be hard drinking. It was a sign of manliness. And if the squire could you know, fall under the table dead drunk at the end of the evening, uh, that was kind of uh, quite a good thing. Um, but that wasn't always the case. And I think the contrasts that are sometimes made between the British hard drinking culture and the way in which Europeans, the, in the rest of the people in the rest of Europe, partic particularly Southern Europe, um, can cope with their drink, um, historically, I don't think, I think that's also a bit of a myth. So I don't think we, we ought to be worried about rising consumption, but we also, also I think, to see it as a, as a kind of long-term issue where consumption has risen and fallen. So, and this is my second point, should we be asking what actually causes those falls, um, uh, those rises and falls in drinking over time? And I think here there are, there are two things to think about, well, three things to think about, really. There's issues around economics, there's issues around what governments do, and then there's a rather much more amorphous issue of what happens in, in the culture. What, what, what do people think is appropriate? The sort of thing that Mike was talking about, people were going to get out of their heads um, at the weekend. Well, economics obviously has um, an impact whether you can afford to drink, whether the price of drink is, is high or low, and also um, how licensing operates, whether it's stringent or whether it's freer, as has happened in recent times. But also government action can um, bring about significant changes. Um, one period where we see this very clearly is during the First World War, um, when there was quite significant restrictions on opening hours, on the strength of drinks, on um, you couldn't treat people, you, you couldn't treat people to a round of drinks, that was forbidden. Um, and that had very significant effects. Um, arrests for drunkenness fell um, almost, well, by more than a half, I think. Um, and cirrhosis deaths also plummeted. Um, so clearly, if government decides to take a, you know, a really stringent uh, attitude, it can make a difference. But I think it's not only economics and government action, um, as I said, it's almost also culture that plays a key role. Because we see this in the late 19th century. Drink was more affordable than it had been before because people's living standards were going up. But um, drink consumption actually started to decline. And that was because people at that stage started to have much wider social and, and leisure time interests. They started to get holidays with pay. Uh, they, they might go to a football match on a Saturday afternoon instead of sitting in the pub, and so on. So that range of activities, that different culture, uh, I think also had an impact. And that sort of thing gathered 
pace in, in the interwar years. So people started going to the cinema, they started doing the football pools, they started gardening and so on. Um, so it's clear that I think it's not just issues of economics, it's also what's happening in the, in the wider context. Obviously social movements are important too, temperance was important in the 19th century, um, but that was only impacting on um, respectable working people. It had quite a limited impact uh, more generally, I think. So I think what's led to rises and declines in the past could also, um, uh, is obviously also having its impact today. Um, both affordability, uh, availability, which we've seen uh, changing over the last few years, um, but also changes in the culture. Now, Mike's talked about the, the downside of that, but also I think there are some interesting signs of cultural change. If we look at the 2010 alcohol statistics, we see that the numbers of young people who are reporting not drinking are actually um, starting to go up. And that's been a discernible trend over quite some years now. Just to quote you one figure, 18% um, of school pupils aged 11 to 15 reported drinking alcohol on the week before they were interviewed. Um, but that figure was lower than in 2001 when 26% of pupils had reported drinking. So I think it's interesting to see that we hear a lot about young people kind of smashed out of their minds, but uh, we don't hear about people who don't drink, and yet that is a growing uh, area and an interesting maybe window into the way culture is changing. I think other aspects of history that we might think about is, uh, one as another aspect is that substances in, and their positions in society don't always say, say, stay the same. Think, for example, about the way that tobacco has become detached from mainstream culture over the last 50 years, or the way in which what we now call illicit drugs um, have also um, changed since the 19th century when, they're opening, when they were opening openly on sale. Um, and so I think what we might be seeing is a kind of rebalancing of the substances so that they're all coming much closer together, tobacco, alcohol, and opium. And finally, let me put one last myth to bed um, because uh, that's something that uh, um, I read about this week. Andrew Lansley, uh, when he had a meeting with the drink industry, was quoted as saying that we all know that prohibition doesn't work. And that's something that really makes historians tear their hair because it's a much more nuanced picture. Prohibition had some positive effects as well as some negative effects. I haven't got time to go into them now. Um, I'm not advocating prohibition, but I'm just saying that we ought to look at examples from the past uh, to see what effects they do and don't have. If we're talking about evidence-based policy, do please remember mm -hmm. history. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, my name is Kristen Wolf. I'm uh, the head of alcohol policy at SAB Miller, and the first thing you're probably going to realize is that I'm not British. So to the extent that I am commenting on the UK drinking culture, it is certainly largely by personal observation. Um, but I want to just at least acknowledge that with my background, I have worked in the brewing industry now for almost 20 years, including the, uh, the brewery that is owned by S.A.B. Miller in the United States. And as part of my work there, I have a very long uh, and knowledgeable engagement, if you will, with the alcohol issue. And in particular, the temperance movement, which uh, was just described, that led to prohibition in the 1920s. And so being a student of that, I, I think I have probably also a unique perspective on what the history teaches and tells us. Um, professionally, though, I've worked in uh, the UK now for the past four years for SAB Miller, which is the second largest brewer in the world. Uh, we originated out of South Africa and are listed on the London Stock Exchange. But as a global uh, brewer, I can tell you that what we see around the world is that there are very nuanced issues when it comes to alcohol consumption and certainly alcohol abuse. It does not look the same in every market. 
Um, we sponsor this battle of ideas largely because we think that it is important for everyone to be able to share different perspectives on alcohol consumption and alcohol abuse because when those different perspectives get brought to bear, certainly I think it results in better policy making in the long run. So what are our views on alcohol consumption and in particular alcohol abuse? First, let me start by saying that we believe that the underlying causes of alcohol abuse are very complex. Um, they go down to the level of individual decision making. And when you're talking about individuals making decisions, there's a whole range of different factors that can come into play. But certainly there is something to be said for the culture, so to speak, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. We also believe that alcohol consumption is for adults and it's a matter of individual judgment and accountability. Because at the end of the day, there is no government person standing there next to you. There is no industry person standing next to you. Individuals make decisions, and those decisions um, are important ones, and they have to live with the consequences if they're poor decisions. We have a vested interest in ensuring that our consumers drink sensibly and responsibly. It is not in our commercial interest to have people abuse our products because when they do, we get conversations about, well, what needs to be done and often those conversations lead to places that are ultimately not really good for anyone and certainly not us. Um, so it is right that governments, in our view, and the alcohol industry and a whole lot of different stakeholders attach a high priority to preventing alcohol abuse. It's a serious issue for society and it's certainly a serious issue for us. However, it is also a fact that most people around the world drink responsibly. And it does add, as uh, Mike just mentioned, it does add to people's enjoyment of social experiences. When we discuss the topic of alcohol abuse in the UK, we should be cognizant of the fact that 80% of men and 90% of women drink responsibly. That means drinking within the chief medical officer's advice of no more than two to three a, a day for women, no more than three to four drinks uh, for men. So we are actually talking really here about the abuse of alcohol by the minority, which is causing the greatest impact on the rest of society. But it's not the overwhelming majority, it's a very small, small segment of the population in total. So what are the points I'd really like to make today? There are really three of them. In, the first point is that what is needed here is a combination of population-based strategies to address alcohol abuse and what we call targeted interventions to address alcohol abuse, meaning those that go down to the level of the individual and, and specifically classes of people who are particularly at risk. But that said, we would not necessarily agree that all of the population-based measures that Mike mentioned are actually the solutions that are going to work. Some population-based measures can be things like having a drink driving law in place. It applies to everybody who decides to drive a car. Those are population-based approaches. But again, some of those um, that were referenced earlier, we don't think are actually shown to be effective. And culturally, the UK seems to be, in my opinion, generally more tolerant of people who abuse alcohol than certainly many other countries around the world, including my own country, the United States. And we'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, and minimum pricing. Um, I know that there's been the reference made by Mike about the need for minimum pricing, but I don't think the evidence is there to show that that's a policy solution that will work. So moving quickly through this, I said that many of the population-based measures that get talked about, the banning marketing, raising the prices of alcohol, restricting the availability, actually are not solutions that work. Um, and certainly they don't work in every market around the world. They have different nuances even in markets. What we can say unequivocally though is that we support targeted interventions. So for example, the medical community, we think that they actually play a very important role in this debate. There is a study that uh, has just come out in the United States that shows that spending a doctor spending five minutes five minutes with a patient talking about whether or not that person is consuming too much alcohol and what the potential impact could be for that person's health in the longer term is highly effective in getting someone to stop, think, and change their behavior. Now, perpetuating that advice over and over and over again and adding you know, a 
half hour discussion on this. If you're someone who doesn't necessarily abuse alcohol, you aren't an alcoholic, but are someone maybe who is showing uh, signs of having behaviors that could lead to problems, if you just keep tacking on for kind of the ordinary person more and more lecturing, that doesn't help. But that five minute intervention can actually make a very big difference. And we think that actually the medical community needs to be brought more into this as part of the solution. Um, the other aspect of public health, yep, the other aspect of public health is that it generally treats all alcohol, or all, excuse me, all people the same. And again, what we think is missing there is that you can't treat all people the same because people come at this with a whole different uh, set of factors that come into play as to why they choose to abuse alcohol. But what we also think is key is the role of parents in all of this. Because parents, at the end of the day, are the biggest billboard, the biggest television ad that a child will ever see. It is important that we get to the parents to encourage them to be good role models for their children when it comes to drinking alcohol and to have the right dialogue with their children as their children begin to grow up. Um, it's interesting, the statistic that was cited earlier about uh, young people drinking, actually about half of the children in the United Kingdom have said that the place where they get their alcohol is from their parents. So if we don't want young people to drink, we actually have to have a conversation with parents. Um, culturally, I will just say that, again, one of the things that struck me when I came to the UK, I lived in a very kind of sleepy community in, uh, outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And one night I was awoken to police lights all over the place because the kids across the street um, had had a party with 150 other of their friends. Um, their parents had gone to India for a month-long vacation and left the 18-year-old in charge. And the 18-year-old had a big party. And at the end of the day, all 150 children were walked out of the house by a police officer. They all had been given a breathalyzer test. Their parents were called one by one and required to come pick their kids up at three o'clock in the morning to take them home and then required to appear in court later to um, have pay the fines that their children now owed. In contrast, in the United Kingdom, there were 67 citations for the entire country on underage drinking. And I, again, I say there's no point in having a law if you aren't going to follow it. And finally, may I just say that with respect to minimum pricing, I don't think that the evidence is actually there. Minimum pricing is a policy that has not been tested anywhere in the world, and despite the fact that there are numerous studies claiming that it will work, what the evidence actually shows is that it probably will reduce the consumption of people who are uh, abusing alcohol by approximately one pint a week. And I think that reflects a bit of the general perception of th this is a you know significant part. I doubt if there's a single person in this room who hasn't experienced the destructive effect of alcohol in their own lives, in their own families, in their own circle of friends. It's a well-recognised social problem, and it, it you know you can argue it one way or the other, but it's probably on the increase. What I wanted, I'm glad Kristen made this point about the efficacy of medical intervention in this thing, because that's what I want to talk about. Just the, that question. What is known as, what Christian outlined, is known as a brief intervention. And a brief intervention has been studied by NICE and other bodies as the most effective uh, form of intervention in this, the, dealing with this problem. It's interesting, it, it becomes, the, as time has gone by, it's got shorter and it's got more effective. It's a heap powerful medicine, I can tell you. It's down to, we used to be talking about 10 or 15 minutes, down to 5 minutes now. And it's, you know, all you'll read endless articles in the medical journals about how effective this is. And indeed, over the, it's been discussed for quite a lot of years now, but over the last six months, it's really made its way into general practice so that now we have all these templates which we use to guide consultations with all sorts of patients with all sorts of problems. Every single template now, whether it's somebody's got diabetes or high blood pressure or any other risk uh, factor, into that template will come the question of uh, their alcohol consumption, and they will be, people will be asked about their alcohol consumption. So you may go to your doctor with a ingrowing toenail or a boil on your finger and say, Doc, I've got a... And your doctor will be looking at his screen and a great thing will be flashing there saying, you've got to fill in this alcohol <coughs> template. And you may think, when he says to you, I'm not interested in your finger, tell me about your alcohol consumption, there's a bit of a strange uh, carry on. But I can tell you it's coming to a surgery near you. If it hasn't already, it will be. And... The basis for this notion is the idea that this five-minute 
discussion between GP and patient is the answer to this great public, the greatest public health problem of our time. And just to give you an idea, what does it involve, this, this discussion? It involves sitting down saying, look, how much do you really drink? And you get the, the chart out that looks, everybody will know this, how to calculate the units of alcohol. You know how many units is in a pint, how many units is in a, you know the, the, the thing. How many units are you, are you drinking? Go through that discussion. Then you say, you've got, I've got a chart here. And in fact, uh, uh, Christian was showing me they've produced a sort of colour version. I've only got a black and white version. But it's, uh, it provides very helpful in indicating the destructive effects of alcohol on every single <coughs> organ and system of the body. So you go through and say, look, did you know that alcohol causes, it's bad for your liver if you drink alcohol? Oh, thanks, Doc. I didn't know that's very, you know, it's bad for your brain, it's bad for your blood vessels, it's bad for everything. So it's quite interesting the terms that in which this is posed, actually. It, it, it indicates a general shift in the whole world of public health towards, the, the, the world of public health is so contemptuous towards the public that it is exempted from the requirements of political correctness. So people will have noticed this thing about the, the minister of health minister says, I want to call people who are obese fat. You're a fat bastard. There, there's no restraint on anybody who's overweight. They can be abused in these terms. Well, if you, if you drink too much, and you, have a, you can have children who are retarded and deformed. You know? They, they don't, children who are uh, uh, produced by people who drink too much do not have learning difficulties. You know? They are retards. I'm surprised it doesn't talk about spastics and mongols, you know, because Down syndrome was for many years, of course, uh, entirely attributed to alcohol until people discovered it was a chromosomal disorder. But I think that's, that's so yeah, you have that discussion. Then you say, oh, yeah, I didn't, so I didn't realize I was drinking so many units. Uh, I didn't realize that it had, could have such a wide range of adverse effects on every organ of my body. Oh, well, let me suggest to you ways in which you might reduce your consumption. How about when you come, and there's a whole list of options, what you, suggestions of what you can say. Uh, when you leave work, don't go for a drink after work. Oh, thanks, Doc. That's a. <laughs> or when you go to the pub, have a, a, a soft drink rather than a pint of beer, or etc., uh, etc. Et or I think I'll go for a drink now on my way home. No, I'll go for a workout at the gym. <laughs> These are the sort of suggestions. So that's the that's the brief intervention. And I I can tell you, I've been to a course on motivational interviewing, <laughs> so I know about how to motivate the patient. At least I've been trained in it. And um, the idea is that this intervention uh, uh, you know, has been studied exhaustively by bodies who evaluate the efficacy of medicine in the most, utmost statistical rigour, you know, uh, evidence-based medicine, Cochrane standards and all that. And this has been found to be a highly effective intervention. Well, think about it for a minute. That we've got a major social problem. It's destroying people's lives on a vast scale. Five minute chat with Doc, it's, it's sorted. <laughs> it couldn't possibly be true. It just couldn't be true, could it? I mean, it just, it's wishful thinking on a cosmic scale, the idea that that can be the solution to the, to the problem of, of alcohol. And you sort of think, and if you look at all these studies, they all, they all cite references. You know, so you look back, hey, really? This is really effective. How, how could that be? And so you think, how, how was that notion of efficacy created? And you look at the studies, how it's done. First of all, you have a small number of people. Secondly, you exclude from them people who have uh, 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 harmful levels of drinking and you only include hazardous levels of drinking. Third, thirdly, you only follow them up for a very short period of time, three months, six months at the maximum. Thirdly, you change the goalposts. You don't define that, the, that you're, what you're trying to achieve is abstinence or even the reduction of uh, drinking levels to a safe limit, but simply a, a reduction or a, 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 a reduced number of uh, binge episodes. And in that way, you can say, this, this really works very well. But you, you can see this is just a, 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 a kind of, a, it's just sort of everybody fooling themselves that something can work. So, you know, this is the, what I'm, I want to really focus on, this question that, that a, a brief intervention is the solution. That there is a problem, and but the, 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 one of the great illusions that surround this is because there is a problem which has medical consequences, it is ipso facto a medical problem which, to which there is a medical solution. There is no medical solution to this. I think Virginia, it, 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 by <laughs> laying out in the historical term, there are economic, political, cultural factors involved in this. There is no medical solution to this problem. But the idea of there being a medical solution is not itself without a lot of problems because it cre I think it's very bad medicine. <coughs> it claims the authority of medical science for an intervention which is actually of, a, of an entirely moralistic, crusading sort of character. We've got the, uh, 
the, the, the band of hope and the Salvation Army without the brass band now marching through your surgery. And the, the other problem about this is that this is going to be visited across the population. This is the interesting thing. It's not targeted on the uh, damaging and serious heavy drinkers. It's going for everybody. And it has a highly, it's rather ironic that doctors' authorities invoke to play this kind of role at a very time when the notion of the authoritative paternalistic doctor is supposed to be history. This is the sort of doctor who tells people how to live their lives that is, is wanted to be reconstructed. Do you want me to finish on this, Susie? I've got a few more things I'd like to say about it, but uh, particularly to draw, to, I think it's bad for the doctor, it's bad for the relation between patients and doctors, but it's very bad for patients because I think it's, it's intruding on their own you know, medical uh, consultation with an entirely different agenda, which is a manipulative, intrusive, authoritarian one, which not only does it not solve the problem, it uh, is, uh, opens the way to a whole set of wider problems. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, before we go out to the floor, I just wanted to push our panel a little bit more on this idea of uh, alcohol being a cultural problem. Um, we, heard, uh, we heard Mike start off by talking about uh, the guys he heard talking on the, uh, on the train about how much they drank. Virginia then told us we had um, a, a variation in consumption depending on uh, uh, fluctuations in people's interests and other things that, that they might have as an option to them. And uh, Kristen talked about individual accountability before Mike Fitzpatrick finished on the idea that there is a, uh, we are perhaps looking at um, policy solutions to the more cultural, cultural issues. So I guess what I'd like to uh, he hear a little bit more from each of you on is whether, if this is a cultural uh, problem, whether A, there's anything we can actually do about it, um, given it's probably down to social etiquette, whether there are things at a policy level that can and also should be done. Um, I guess I'll start with uh, you, Mike, if you have some yeah, thoughts sure. on that. Yeah, um, sure. <clears throat> well, I think it, several points are made by each of the speakers, which makes it very, very clear that it is a cultural issue. Um, when um, Kristen talks about the variation across different countries, different societies, um, I think that's demonstrable in itself. Uh, uh, Mike's... Uh, references to uh, the changes in um, changes in the nature of relationships between doctors and patients, uh, the references that Virginia made to different <coughs> historical periods. And there are two things I think it, you can draw from that. One is that the, because the problem is part political, part economic, part cultural, part behavioral, there clearly isn't one solution. That's absolutely right. And anyone who claims there is a magic bullet to the problem uh, is misleading you. And with that, I would agree with Mike on that, absolutely. But cultures do and can change. And I think the historical evidence that Virginia drew upon um, across time shows that you, there are different fashions, tastes change. And so for that reason, I don't think it's an absolutely hopeless problem. It is something that we should work towards trying to, um, trying to bring about the, the sorts of beneficial effects uh, of these different things. And in that regard, changing cultures, of course, is something that Politicians have tried for generations and centuries to do. Um, various leaders have politically have tried to do. Cultures tend to change of their own accord. Uh, sometimes with a bit of a push, um, legislatively, sometimes as a consequence of massive, so massive social dislocations, things like world wars and that sort of thing. So the fact that the cultures change means that this problem is um, remediable in certain degrees, but I think uh, presently our ability to pull the levers of those cultures are not, um, not as well defined perhaps as they might be. <coughs> yeah, I think one of the um, things that people um, in the alcohol area have been looking at, one of the bits of history they have looked at, is what's happened with tobacco um, over the last 50 years. If we'd been sitting here 50 years ago, we all would have been smoking. The room would have been full of smoke. No, it would have been no problem. Um, so what's caused that tremendous change? You know, we, we wouldn't dream of smoking in this, in this room now. Um, so people have started to look at what, what were the engines of cultural change there. Um, and it wasn't necessarily um, what governments did, because governments did things like health education in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, but possibly that had an impact. So I think, um, and really it wasn't until the late 
70s that taxes on tobacco started to, uh, duty on tobacco started to go up, but already the numbers of smoke, people smoking was in decline. So something was changing in the culture before the government started to uh, intervene um, at a higher level, and obviously that then led to things like the smoking ban. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting process of kind of interaction between, you know, things that happen like media campaigns, maybe health pressure groups, uh, the way the issue gets talked about in the media, um, rather than necessarily for formal government policy. So I think that's, that's an interesting comparison. But also, people are now starting, I've just been reading a grant application um, that I've got to report on next week, as something that's evaluating something called DA. And I thought, what is DA? And DA is what's now called in the alcohol field, diversionary activities. So uh, people are actually kind of, it's not only brief interventions, it's diversionary activities that are being um, talked about as well. Thank you. Kristen, do you want to come back and some of this? Um, yeah, and I, I think the first point to recognize here in all of this is that it doesn't matter what topic we would be sitting up here debating, there is always going to be a segment of society that kind of bucks the trend or they buck the law and they say, you know, I'm just not going to do it. That's why we have jails and we have all kinds of things out there because there's always a segment of society that doesn't follow what the rest of society thinks is, is appropriate. Um, but with that said, I think actually, and I would agree with you, Mike, that, you know, cultures can change. And I think a, a very good example of that happening is in the UK. And I think that the people in the UK ought to be quite proud of what they've achieved with drink driving. Because if you look at the issue of drink driving, there was a time, as I understand it, that drink driving was a very socially accepted practice. And I can tell you, again, based on my own experience, that you know, the, one of the very first um, events that we went to was a school event, and my husband and I showed up at this country club. It was a parents' evening, and it was one of those marital moments in the car. Was like, you know, are you sure we have the right night? There's no one here. Uh, what's going on? And you know, so we walked to the back of the of the club, and the whole room was full of people. And towards, you know, there are a few people within in the group at the end of the evening that were taking bottles of vodka and just downing it. And we were shocked because, again, culturally, that's something that you would never see. It wouldn't be tolerated in the culture I come from. But equally probably shocking to every British person standing there is that at the end of the evening, my husband and I got back into our car and we drove home. Um, and I know that, you know, as the line of taxis showed up, we felt a bit embarrassed by that because we said, aha, that's why there was no one here and we thought the place was empty because all the cars were left at home and they all took taxis. So, you know, what made drink driving and that cultural change that came with that was the fact that there was a law put in place and there was a policy decision made that that law was going to be enforced. There were consequences, big ones, if you did it. And there was a public awareness made of those consequences. And so I think you've achieved a lot with respect to that issue. It's not solved because, as I said at the outset, there's always a segment of society that bucks the trend. But certainly it can be achieved with the right policy and the right communications. Um, yes, I, I mean, I really want to emphasize the point that that we shouldn't, because there is such a big problem, which has such medical consequences, we shouldn't delude ourselves that there's a medical solution to it. I think that's the key message. But I would like to comment on this issue of the culture shift and the role uh, and the example of smoking. I think it's quite interesting to see that the decline, the substantial decline in smoking uh, in, in this country took place in the 60s, 70s and 80s before the mo more coercive measures came in. And they've had actually a very marginal effect on that. What the, what, if one of the consequences that they have had, and I can testify this because I have very, uh, uh, not many, but I've got quite a few patients who make a substantial living in the cigarette smuggling industry. If anybody wants to see me afterwards, I can put them in touch <laughs> if you want a couple of hundred Benson and Hedges, which is a, now accounts for a very substantial section of the uh, cigarettes bought in inner London, and good living can be made out of it. Um, which also comes back to the prohibition issue, which is, I think Virginia uh, makes this point, which is, is uh, uh, you know, I think what, well recognised that people say prohibition wasn't effective. It was quite effective in reducing overall alcohol consumption. What it was also very effective in doing was fostering a major corporate crime culture, which is still had, has a major influence in American society since then. And I think you can already see that uh, uh, possibly extending uh, from the, uh, in the cigarette area and in the... Uh, 
um, uh, the into the alcohol area. Because the, there's a drive now towards mo more, more coercive measures across the board here. That's what's striking in the, 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 all the public health discussion. It's quite interesting. One thing that they've, they've come to the conclusion that one of the, 10 years ago you'd have had a major discussion about how important it is to educate children in the units so they can all calculate the units. Well, after a while, you know, people have realised that it's totally useless and ineffective. And mercifully, then, people have given up on that pretty much, you know, it's still people will want to be wasting children's time at school telling them useless information of that sort. Uh, adds on to another great list of useless sorts of information which poor children have inflicted on them at school. Um, it's a wonder if many of them can continue going at all, I often think, with the amount of health education that gets uh, put on them. But uh, that's a, a wider problem. But I think uh, the recognition of the failure of those sorts of strategies leads to this endless, because something must be done about this. And so when there's nothing effective that you can think of doing, then do something that sounds good. And this is, of course, a great appeal to politicians. So there's all this discussion, raise the prices, uh, you know, and, and there'll be produced some evidence from some country which suggests that that did produce a, a reduction in consumption. Uh, take a harder line against people drinking outdoors. All these sorts of uh, coercive, authoritarian sort of measures and the hope that they will work. I think the lesson of history is that they're unlikely to. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a lot there to get your teeth into, so if I could see some questions, I'll take um, three, well, four or five hands at a time, and then I'll come back to the panel for a response. Can I see the microphones? Okay, great. Um, could I take this gentleman here at the front in the green, please? And then the guy in the black jacket behind him. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, particularly a question for Virginia. Um, when I was growing up, I, I certainly think I sensed uh, a more... Um, that there was more shame and social stigma attached, particularly around public drunkenness. I don't know whether that's just my view of things, so it'd be quite interesting to hear sort of Virginia's opinion as to whether that's true. If it was true, and we have sort of made an, a society we're now more prepared to accept so, um, public drunkenness, is there anything we can do to actually turn that back and change it? Thanks. Um, if I'll take this side of the room in this round and that side of the room in the next, so can I just see hands on this side? Okay, yep, that guy. No. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting from, from Mike Kelly that you, you mentioned drinking career, okay, which means I've now got two careers which my mother would be uh, very happy with. Um, and without, without um, belittling you know, the issues that there are there, particularly in places like Hackney where, 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 where Mike you know, works and, and sees a lot of social deprivation possibly linked to alcohol, um, I'm tempted to say we need a little bit more honest and human discussion about this because very few people drink in moderation. Okay, I certainly don't. Okay, I'm a great believer of going to the pub for one is a complete waste of money and waste of time. Um, and when Sad Miller say drink responsibly, we all know really that that's not what people do. Um, people manage their alcohol intake and drink at different times and different amounts for different reasons. And we need to have a much more honest assessment about this. And when 80% of people say they drink responsibly, they're lying. And when 18% of children say they've drunk alcohol last week, they're lying. Okay, so we need a much more honest um, assessment of this. Um, and I'd go so far as to say that um, young people particularly, where I do actually think there is a problem with binge drinking, but ironically, it's because they don't drink enough. Okay, because if you ever go into a pub, when was the last time, seriously, you ever saw anybody in a pub under the age of about 25? Um, I very rarely see 18-year-olds in pub. I work at a university and I take groups of students abroad, and when they get there and they get hold of drink, they, they go wild because they don't drink in pubs. They don't drink enough in environments where they learn to how to handle their drink. Okay, so, ironically, it's the, the, the measures being taken to stop people drinking, which actually means that you create the problem or a, a possible problem in the first place. Okay, thanks. Um, could I, this guy just on the inside in the blue shirt? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think there's, there's a possible, as Mike's kind of alluded to, that there is a problem of uh, potential binge sermonising. I mean, it was okay when the government was just doing, like, doing two or three health warnings a day, but now it's 40 or 50 sermons a week, and uh, they're getting less and less effect and demanding more and more sermons just to get the same hit. Uh, I think that's a, a bad sign. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, what Mike Kelly was saying earlier, what always strikes me about um, when, when people talk about the negative effects of something, in this case, alcohol, and there are, I don't want to, dismiss the idea that there aren't uh, negative effects. You always miss the positive side because it's impossible to measure. So, for example, nobody goes into A&E and says, 
Hello, I, I had a, a binge drinking experience last night. I had five or six pints. Um, poured my heart out to my colleague about how, what a terrible time I'm having at work, and I feel better today. Um, because, you know, obviously that, you, know, you get the kind of the head wound from falling over or the, uh, the, uh, the, the getting people's stomach pumped, but you don't get the kind of positive aspect. Or, you know, that you know, I got a bit drunk last night and I finally hooked up with the, with the woman that I've been uh, pussyfooting around for ages because, you know, being British, I'm too shy to, I mean, without, uh, too shy to, to do anything without having a drink. So, uh, you know, while, you know, we, we, should, we should look at these things in terms of ne negative effects, we, we have to see the positive side as well. Uh, and realise that, you know, from that point of view, the, the majority of people that you're talking about, the people with this gradually rising consumption, for them, they feel alienated by being lectured about their drinking, therefore, because that's not the way that they experience it. They experience their drinking occasionally as a negative experience, but most of the time as a positive one. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, I've I've got three more hands on this side, and they're the last that I'm going to take. So could I take this gentleman at the front in the blue shirt, please? Um, two points. Uh, just like to support the, I think it was really the, the, the full panel that culture is such an important aspect of this debate. Um, my family lived in France for two years, and it is absolutely staggering the different cultural treatment of alcohol and uh, being drunk in public and all the other associated aspects of alcohol and, and you know just a channel away but it just seems like a, um, a solar system away in terms of the, the viewpoints so I think there is a lot of you know gold in those hills in terms of getting to the bottom of uh, alcohol abuse issues by, by studying cross-culturally and as close as 22 miles away from here um, secondly I think the next big wave of, of trying to make society more healthy and hygienic, of course, is, is food abuse. Um, and uh, I was absolutely fascinated. And so there might be something to gain by looking at what's happening there at a much earlier stage in terms of how we can learn on, on the alcohol abuse side. So I was absolutely fascinated spending some time in Manhattan recently with the uh, rule changes they've had there where all calories uh, and any food that is commercially served in restaurants of any kind, fast food and, and sit down, where all, all the calories of all the food now needs to be listed on the menus and in any advertising, in posters and so on. It is absolutely having a huge impact. And so I just thought I would throw that to the crowd and maybe comment on that. Okay, thanks. Um, these last two points at the back of the room, um, could you try and be as succinct as possible, please, so that we can get all of the points in? Mike issued a, a warning against uh, uh, expecting um, uh, a, a medical solution. I would like to warn against um, asking too much of a cultural explanation because the word culture is just another way of saying what people do. You can't explain what people do by saying it's what people do. It, it really doesn't get you very far. Um, I want to say something, and I, I will be uh, brief, about um, the fun of uh, getting drunk. And it strikes me that the game of it uh, in the past has been to play with the idea of being a rational, capable individual and to deliberately flout the rules and expectations uh, of, of that kind of persona. But now it seems to me that um, so much of the elite, the authorities, the establishment, what you, whatever you want to call them, um, uh, relate to and treat uh, the majority of the population as more or less permanently incapable and irrational. So what do people do when they have one or two drinks too many? They live up to those expectations. It's an invitation, uh, uh, the, the new sobriety, is actually an invitation to demonstrate that we are incapable. And uh, believe it or not, people do sometimes live up to that prophecy. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, yes. Um, one, one primarily for um, uh, Kristen. Given that your industry has um, an interest in and an ability to influence the level of alcohol consumption um, through advertising or marketing, would you say that the current level of alcohol consumption in this country is too low or too high, and do you use your policy to increase or decrease the level of alcohol consumption? Okay, thank you. This is the last part of that. I got the gist of it. Okay, um, I'll ask our panel now to respond to uh, any of the points or questions they felt um, pertinent. Would you like to start with? 
Do I get to go first each time? I... That's good. Actually, I thought there are a number of very um, uh, insightful points made there by, by the audience, and I'd perhaps say a little about some of them. I, I hope, and I deliberately began my talk by um, talking about the pleasures of alcohol, because you cannot um, have a, a discussion about this topic without acknowledging that, as I think you said and uh, several other people alluded to. Um, because uh, we, if you adopt purely a moral uh, tone toward this or a disapproving tone, um, you're right. The message just falls on deaf ears. And the reality of people's lives, and I think that was the point that uh, perhaps one of the last uh, uh, commentators made, uh, the reality of people's lives is that they see it and experience it in a very different way uh, to the kinds of way in which uh, I, looking at it in terms of population level harm, would see it. And to, to, to try to do it only on the basis of population level harm is, is uh, you're absolutely right, is destined to failure. So um, the significance both of people's real experiences of using alcohol and the fun that they have in doing it and the fun they have uh, in moving into that world of Dionysus, of loss of control, um, of abandonment of order, uh, is something which uh, makes it uh, socially very, uh, very enjoyable from time to time. Second point, and I think was the first um, commentator made, was about this question of social stigma. I think you're absolutely right. There is a world of difference culturally now to the acceptance of public drunkenness in a way that certainly wasn't true in the 1960s uh, when I was growing up and when I first had my first alcoholic drink. What there were, of course, were places where um, drunkenness was tolerated, but they tended to be behind closed doors in a, in a funny kind of way. Certain types of badly run pubs um, uh, student union bars was another place where, you know, behaviour was tolerated, which you would simply would not be tolerated in the street. But there were differences across the country. Um, and I first saw public drunkenness on a large scale when I moved to Scotland. And I saw things there uh, which I had never seen in the east end of London or the cities of York and Leicester where I'd, I'd been, been educated. So there were differences. But at this, 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 there has, I think, been a shift of tolerance and the British, by, by nature, are a tolerant people, I think, and we've moved towards a toleration of stuff that um, perhaps is, um, uh, is, is different to, to what it was. Quite why that's happened and what one does to reverse it, I'm, I'm sure we, we know less about, but I think as an observation, uh, it seems to me to, to be absolutely, absolutely spot on. There was another theme that a couple of people got at, and I think this is terribly important. Uh, Self-report data on alcohol consumption is probably hopelessly misleading. If you compare the customs and revenue data on alcohol purchased and people's self-reports of what they drink, about half of it must be poured down the sink. <laughs> Clearly, well, perhaps it is, or it's just in a cupboard somewhere. Perhaps some of it is as well. Um, and of course, this is a topic where we, we, we mislead ourselves, actually. Um, if, you, if, you do, if you're doing social research now, or you ask people how much they drink, they systematically underestimate. But that syst systematic underestimation um, is probably consistent uh, within different social groups. So it's a real problem um, in terms of what, what the data uh, really mean and what the data we can really, really do without it. Thank Stop. Yep. Um, yeah, the point about public drunkenness were, was interesting. I think... Certainly in the 60s, it, it wouldn't have been um, something that was acceptable in public. But if you went back to the 1890s and certain parts of the country, then yes, it, it, it would have been the norm. So it's very much time and place dependent. And even in the recent past, I think um, it's de been dependent on place. As Mike said, a PhD student of mine has just finished a thesis on Nottingham. And Nottingham seems to have had a long tradition of public drunkenness, um, partly because of the, the wide open spaces and so on. So, you know, the kind of recent prominence of Nottingham as a hotbed of binge drinking is, is historical as well. It's, it's been culturally tolerated there. Um, I think one of the interesting issues around, um, somebody else mentioned about um, people not knowing, about, not knowing how to behave or not knowing about drinking in pubs that the, the market, I think, has become much more segmented, hasn't it? That people don't go to pubs as a family um, so much, or it used to be a male bonding thing where the son went with the father and the father taught the son how to drink. 
um, and the market has become much more segmented into the vertical drinking establishments for young people, bars where young people go, and people like me, you know, wouldn't dream of entering, and so on, you'd just feel uncomfortable. So that's been a big change too. Um, on binging, um, just to make one point, people talk a lot about binge drinking, but one thing that we found in some research we did is that the definition of binge drinking is actually very confused. It changes a lot across, you know, what people mean by binge drinking. And it's also changed across time, too. If you were talking about binging in the 40s and the 50s, you'd be talking about things like the lost weekend, you know, where somebody went on a bender over the whole weekend, not a Friday night uh, activity as we talk about now. So again, just something to think about. Um, cross-cultural, just one final point. Yes, it's interesting what goes on in Europe, but I think the cross-cultural dimension that's interesting at the moment is the way in which kind of American norms are being imported into um, the UK. And the idea of having calories listed on the menu fills me with horror. Uh, could I not enjoy a meal out? But um, anyway, I'll leave the point on industry to, um, <laughs> to you to answer. Yep, and I guess I'll answer the question that was directed specifically at me. And I think it's important to remember that beer in particular is a product that's been around for 10,000 years. And I'm always reminded that when I spoke with um, one of our colleagues from our Hungarian brewery, he talked about the time when in Hungary, uh, right after the repeal of of communism, when communist fi communism finally failed. He said, you know, prior to that, they would only have a sign in the store that said, shoes sold here, okay? Now, there was no branded advertising. There was nothing that suggested in any way that now suddenly because, you know, Prada came into Hungary that there was going to be a spike in people buying shoes. People always bought shoes. Marketing does not have the impact in terms of increasing consumption of a product that is already widely consumed. What it does have, we hope anyway, in theory, and we spend a lot of money on marketing to try and do this, is to get someone to drink a Peroni over a Carlsberg or over a Stella Artois. Um, and I think if you look at markets where, in fact, well over half the alcohol consumed in those markets is informally produced, like markets in like Africa, where there is no advertising that accompanies what somebody is making off in a tank somewhere in, in some rural area. It doesn't mean that people don't drink. They still drink. They just aren't drinking branded products. And so keep that in mind that this is really about shifting people from drinking one product into another. It doesn't get people to drink overall. Um, and I guess I have to close there. Um, I, I'd like to comment on, as other people have, on your point about public shame, which I think is very interesting, the contrast with the young people on the train celebrating getting off their faces. And I think that it is a striking contrast, I think, when we were young, to be a man was to be able to show you could hold your drink rather than getting off your face. And I think that's a very significant dis difference. You know, we, uh, you know, tried to pretend that we were sober, even though we could hardly walk, you know, because that was to be hard, you know. Whereas now, you sense that they have a few drinks and start falling all over the place because that's kind of a, a expected sort of behavior. And it's becoming incapable has become the object of drinking. As, and in all these terms, off your face, bladdered, which are all relatively new slang terms, which celebrate. And all these television programs about these holiday destinations in, I don't know, where kids go and get, it seems that all they do is get off their faces as the entire end and object of the exercise, which does seem a rather anomic sort of social experience. And I think it does, there is an issue about learning how to drink here. France is an interesting, you know, people look to different examples because France has this convivial family drinking thing, but it has astronomical rates of liver cirrhosis compared with Britain. People talk about the rates of liver cirrhosis increasing in Britain, but that's because they started at a very low level and they're still nowhere near the level of France. So that's a, you know, the Manhattan example is fascinating, of course, contrast your recent experience with watching Mad Men, and people are watching Mad Men. I mean, the cigarette and alcohol consumption in Mad Men, this is 60s Manhattan, it's just breathtaking. How did anybody manage to stand up at work, you know? Uh, or indeed even look after their kids, you know? They were just drunk and drinking, but not drunk, not often drunk, and not drunk at work, even though they drank all the time at work. So people learned cultures of drinking in a, in a, and handled it in an entirely different way. Okay, thank you for that. Um, if I could see hands on this side of the room, uh, starting with the guy next to you in the blue shirt, please. Yep. Um, 
Some of you have spoken about the success of making drink driving socially unacceptable. And I think you could say that to a certain extent, smoking has become a lot less socially acceptable. You said no one had dreamed of having a cigarette. I was actually dreaming of having a cigarette in here, but <laughs> I realize you can't roll back time. With drink driving uh, uh, becoming more and, more and more unacceptable, it's also a kind of thing where if, if somebody's in a pub and they look like they've had a few too many to drive home, their friends will say, oh, you don't want to drive home. It's a risk. You might lose your license. You might be in an accident. You know, there's very, very real kind of problems with the old behavior that are very immediate. They have consequences that are very sudden and, and quite violent. And I think people could see the potential of that. And that was the way that that particular kind of problem was addressed. To try to move those kinds of concerns over to eating trans fats or drinking responsibly, I think it's, it's just basically wrong because you're missing out on what was very particular about people's attitudes to drink driving. There's been many sorts of studies of drink driving, and actually if you have a, a couple of drinks, and this has been done off-road obviously, uh, you're actually better at driving. You know, you have, you have two, two, you're more confident, you are actually better. You go faster around tracks, but it's obviously after two or three you lose the keys. Okay, could I see, show of hands again, could I take um, this, this guy in the yellow and grey stripey, please? Um, hi there. I'm a medical SHO uh, junior doctor who's working in de the prior bit of North London. It's really a question for Dr. Fitzpatrick, actually, um, about evidence-based interventions. Um, I mean, I'm a bit surprised at the way that you're sort of poo-pooing poo kind of GP-based um, interventions and um, counselling of, of sort of stopping the slippery slope of alcoholism. Um, and the reason for that is, I guess, that um, as I understand it, um, evidence-based medicine, the premise of it is you make an intervention, you test it, you see if it works, and then you follow it up prospectively, and you look and you see if, they, if it has any effect. And it's all very well saying that, you know, you've got the, the studies are small, that, you know, the evidence is... Li well, I mean, how on earth are you meant to collect evidence unless you have a long intervention period? And I, I feel quite uncomfortable, really, with the, um, the sort of the kind of discourse that's put around about the sort of the the, um, the sort of um, the anti-libertarianism of of these public health interventions, and specifically about you know this this great evil of telling people you know of advising people not to drink and advising people that it can cause some harm. And I remember when the smoking ban was coming in, certainly that you had sort of David Hockney and people like that up on stage, really sort of coming up with some pretty spurious arguments about how we were going we were sliding into tyranny and and you know oppression and actually people were coming out with the same arguments then which were well there's no um there's no evidence for this and actually as countries almost simultaneously have imposed smoking bans actually the evidence is being collected that actually the public health okay. gains are really marked and similarly um i'm sorry i've forgotten your name but the, the lady from the from the brewery yes. i <laughs> um Similarly, you, you, you talked about the, the lack of evidence for, um, for a minimum pricing. Well, again, as I understand it, you know, there's not the, the reason there's no evidence is because nobody's tried it. And surely the, the solution to you know, seeing if this works is actually to do it, do some prospective studies, and then actually see if you have a, an outcome which is good in the end. Okay, thank you for that. Sorry, could I ask everybody to be very, very quick with their points now? Could you pass the microphone back to the lady in the white top, please? Uh, Mike, I, th I thought you were a bit careless to point out that three, the three deaths under 50 uh, were uh, alcohol-related without pointing out that that's largely because the under 50s don't die of anything else these days. You know, it's, it's a sign of medical progress rather than necessarily a sign of the problems of, of drink. Under 50s only die of um, accidents and suicide these days. Um, I just wanted to raise a, a, a thought about what our recent experience in Manchester because it's now... Um, uh, they've introduced a new requirement on pubs in Manchester now that you, you can't sell any alcohol in glass within a mile of a football stadium in Manchester now, which we all opposed because we didn't like the idea of it. But actually, plastic glasses have come a long way. Um, and we don't mind it. And it's actually reduced harm in its broadest sense by sig really significant levels. So there are interventions that don't involve <coughs> stopping people drinking and having a good time that can make a difference, and I, and I wonder whether we, sh we shouldn't spend a bit of time investigating those. 
Okay, thank you. Um, could I take that gentleman with, at the back? Yep. Yeah, uh, the guy who was just saying about no one's tried the minimum pricing, um, that's not true. Gorbachev tried it in the Soviet Union in the late 80s, and uh, all that happened was people who couldn't afford it um, brewed it at home or bought it illegally. Um, so kind of infringement on civil liberties arguments aside, uh, it doesn't work. So. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, could I just take, sorry, this gentleman at the front in the grey top, could I have the other microphone just go to Josie Appleton, who I'm going to give the last point to, um, please, thank you. Yep. This uh, question is for Kristen. Um, uh, depending on what figures you use, uh, alcohol costs, as Mike rightly uh, said, approximately 12 billion. Of that 12 billion, 2.7 is footed by the NHS. There's no doubt that the industry needs to take responsibility for the burden it places on the health system. And Andrew Lansley has made it clear in the responsibility deal that the industry will play a role in delivering public health messages. How does SAB Miller intend to do this in a legitimate and an effective way without undermining uh, your bottom line, but does speak to public health and medical discourses? Okay, thanks, Josie. Yeah, no, I've um, been at a, couple, a few alcohol conferences recently putting a sort of civil libertarian case, and um, there's a few striking features of alcohol policy. One was the sheer megalomania of it, and the fact that they actually saw no limits to what they thought they could do. So they were talking about uh, stopping people from putting beer in their garages, um, closing down Facebook groups that promoted particular products, um, banning the names of certain drinks, no, sh no shooters, no sh certain shots, uh, banning certain drink receptacles. I think there is a sort of complete megalomania of alcohol policy. At the same time, there's a real uh, replacement of social policy. When you think they talk about every single social problem in the world being linked to alcohol. So uh, restraining alcohol is going to solve unemployment, it's going to stop murder, uh, armed rob robbery, all these things. I think there's a real failure of social policy to pin everything on alcohol. And what it's really about is essentially seeing every social problem as a result of, of um, the loss of restraint. Um, I think kind of people's emotions or the loss of inhibition is seen as, as the cause of every crime. I think we're kind of returning to a 19th century view of crowds and emotions, the idea that release itself um, causes all these problems. I think that for me, I would rein in alcohol policy um, and really uh, see the value of social policy for actually solving those problems because it's a loss of social imagination that's at the, at the heart of this. Um, and, a, and a sort of overbelief in the idea that you can change the name of a drink or change, you know, change an advert and to think that, that you know, that's going to solve everything. Okay, thank you. I'm going to come back to the panel now. Sorry I couldn't take all of the viewpoints from the floor. Um, could I ask you, Mike, just to respond to some of those points and to make any closing remarks? Yeah, the, the, the only one I will respond to, not, though I think many of the points were made are extremely interesting, uh, relates to the minimum pricing. Uh, minimum price per unit... Uh, is not a policy designed to um, tackle the problem of the responsible drinker. Um, the fact is that harmful drinkers migrate to the cheapest alcohol products they can find. And minimum price per unit is a most highly targeted measure um, designed to um, hit those people whose consumption of alcohol is already in dangerous levels. Um, at the kinds of uh, price that one models these things at at 50p or 40p per unit as a minimum price, it would have no effect um, on premium brands. In fact, um, I'm surprised, a little surprised at your response, Kristen, because a number of the premium brands in this country, notably Young's, uh, Fuller's, and Tesco's themselves, have come out in favour of it. Partly because, of course, minimum price per unit would increase the profits to um, their companies rather than uh, to the exchequer. And the reason that um, minimum pricing uh, was was regarded as the soundest evidence-based solution in this regard, rather than simply hiking up um, tax or duty, is that if you hike up tax or duty, it doesn't target those who are drinking dangerously, and it does impose uh, a burden on the whole population, including responsible drinkers. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just a couple of points. Um, drink driving, yes, it's been a great success in, in many ways, but the reason it first got on the statute book was not because it was seen as an alcohol issue, but because it was seen as a road safety issue. So being, when it was defined as a 
alcohol issue, people thought it was temperance and they were totally against it. But once it got a broader coalition around it, then it could make progress. So I think there might be a lesson there about how change occurs. Um, Gorbachev didn't work quite right, but what succeeded it didn't work either. And I think the reason Gorbachev didn't work was because it didn't have that kind of popular culture supporting it. It was just acting, his policy was acting totally in isolation. On the civil liberties issue, just one point I'd like to make, uh, which we haven't really talked about, is the way in which some of these civil liberties issues are being targeted particularly at women. And it's women's drinking, and particularly pregnant women's drinking, um, which is being uh, focused on. And I think there are kind of civil liberties issues there around you know, the potential testing of women doing pregnancy and things like that. Thank you. If I can just make one quick comment back to Mike. All of our brands sold in the UK are premium brands as well, and we'd make money hand over fist if we had a minimum pricing structure in place here. The closest structure like it is in Canada, where it's one of the most profitable beer markets in the world. Um, but nonetheless, we think it's a total interference on, on the free market economy and, and the dynamics that are in play. So we can come back to that at another point. But I wanted to address the gentleman's question about um, our, how we're going to support public health messages. And in fact, one of our core beliefs on alcohol is that information to consumers is vital and that information should be accurate and balanced. And to that point, we were the first company in the UK to step up to the plate when the government asked uh, a few years ago for the Drinkware Trust to be formed. We were the first company in the UK to step up to fund that. We were the first company in the UK to put the complete chief medical officer's advice on product labels as requested. It was voluntary, but we chose to do it. And we put it not only on our labels, but you'll also find it on all of what we call our secondary packaging or the outer packaging. Um, we also have a website, TalkingAlcohol.com, which was referenced earlier in my little shameless plug. Um, this website was produced in conjunction with um, medical experts around the world. Um, and you might find it interesting, but this website is now on NHS Choices and is also the, the single largest user of our website, because we can track who's coming, is the NHS, which shocked us more than I probably uh, can tell you. Um, so. Right now, we are actively engaged with the government in their responsibility deals discussions and where they're talking about different things that the alcohol industry can do to step up. We're at the table and we'll certainly entertain more of these ideas as it comes forward. Thank you, Kristen. Um, yeah, th three deaths under 50 is not a lot, but I can tell you, you know, if you see the, all three had young children, you know, and if you're confronted with these families, I can understand people feeling an urgency to try and do something about these problems, you know, I'm, and I wouldn't underestimate that it's a very big problem. Um, my concern is, you know, with the measures that are proposed and the areas in which they're proposed, and as I'm saying, I, I think uh, medical practice is not an area which is conducive to, to, in any way to, the, to resolving these problems. The passive smoking issue that was raised, I think, is a, a good example, actually, and I think Hockney was broadly right. Uh, that uh, of the abuse of epidemiology in the cause of politics. You know, you had uh, a whole number of studies which have statistically insignificant increases in mortality multiplied by vast population numbers to create the idea of passive smoking causing a significant level of uh, disease. It's science reduced to propaganda, and I think it's uh, very damaging uh, the, for the whole world of epidemiology to be misused in that sort of way. The, the, the next wave of claims that are made for benefits after the smoking are even more preposterous. There was a claim made in Scotland that it, it reduced the rate of coronary heart disease, which had to be withdrawn because it was so ludicrous uh, uh, very shortly after it was made. This is the abuse of science, and it's a, a very significant problem. It degrades science and medical practice. That comes on to this issue of brief interventions, and I tried to show in the same way how these studies are spun you know, in a way which is, you know, not consistent with science. It's consistent with politics, but it's not uh, uh, something that should be done in medical science. And what's happening here is that the relationship between the doctor and patient is being transformed into the relationship between a sort of therapist and a client, or indeed a priestly role between a priest and a sinner in, in some respects. Now, some doctors may find that congenial role. I personally don't, and I don't think that doctors should be playing that sort of a role. And you know, furthermore, it's a relationship between a therapist and a client which is not sought by the patient. You know, they don't come in, but they suddenly find themselves in a shifted uh, 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 relationship. It's a there's a manipulative 
element to that. There's a paternalistic, uh, 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 authoritarian element to it, which I think is uh, something that doctors ought to resist and which is uh, detrimental to their relations with their patient and detrimental above all to the patient. The second the, of, of the 12 steps, that, which is actually the source of most of these behavioral interventions in alcohol, and for which there are very much more persuasive claims for efficacy, is we confess that we were powerless before alcohol. And there's a sort of notion of, you know, generating alcohol can make you impotent, but the the widespread notion of the, uh, the problem of an alcohol-dependent culture n nourishes an idea of the impotence of the individual and the impotence of society before this problem, which actually is more likely to have a paralyzing than a beneficial effect. Okay, can we thank our speakers? Um, this, the session has stimulated a, mo a lot more... Um, discussion than it could ever have answered so um, we'd really like it if everybody could come over to Imperial College to the Queen Tower rooms for a drink and to carry on the discussion uh, please also try to check out Foyle's bookshop and also the ideas market between sessions uh, tomorrow thank you